All right, everyone, welcome back to another weekly roundup edition of On the Margin. Today, I'm joined, as always, by my cheery co-host, Mr. Mark Yusko. You know, uh, that's the perfect word. Michael, you know, it's funny. Um, someone like tweeted at us that, no, so, so, so did you say it? Uh, someone tweeted at us yesterday that, you know, it was a shame that, you know, it's such a great podcast last week. It should have got way more views, you know, but everybody's watching TikTok. So I said, you know, instead of the sock reveal, I think I'll do a TikTok, TikTok dance. dance. Oh boy. And then I'm like, no, then we'd lose all of our listeners. <laughs> so I, I'm still going to do the sock reveal. Nice. And so I am, I am wearing the cheery Bitcoin orange pants, right? Uh, it's Bitcoin mm-hmm. Friday. And I am wearing the, you know, rest in peace. Bitcoin's dead. Nice. You know, again, everybody's saying Bitcoin's dead. And you've heard of the uh, magazine cover curse, right? Mm. So I have actually. This, yeah, yeah. This is the I'm magazine cover of The Economist. Yeah. Okay. Crypto's downfall, end of the world. Oh, and, and let's just think about some, mag- some recent magazine covers. So, you know, this was from August. Not so good. Not so good. Yeah. And before that, there was this guy, Eddie Lampert. He was going to be the next Buffett. Okay, I didn't, didn't realize that out. that was a curse. I didn't realize that the next Buffett is a curse. There's a oh uh, no, Bill baby, Ackman. and Bill Ackman. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, nice. and and then there's then there's this one. You know, a year ago, precisely one year ago. Uh, you know, this lovely gentleman was called Man of the Year, Elon Man of the Year. His stock's down forty three percent since then. Forty three percent. So, yeah. magazine covers are are a curse. So the fact that, uh, you know, everyone's saying it's over, Bitcoin's dead. And I was going to look up the, the, the tracker. You know, there's a Bitcoin is dead dot com or something that or rest in peace, Bitcoin. And we're up to like 500 and something. I think you gave us the, Yeah, you gave us the tick last time. It was over 500 yeah. now. Um, yeah. So welcome so, to the quincentennial is that a word Quince- yeah know. quincentennial that's right yeah there we yeah, go right. um yeah. okay nice well good for us so uh, you know on that topic there's uh you know i, I want to spend some time in in macro line because we, we went pretty deep on crypto uh last podcast but um you know the the big story this week i suppose and ultimately the question that i want to ask you is is do you see a bottom forming here but before before i get there i want to uh get into this whole genesis uh saga so um you know for those of you who who didn't fall, weren't following this earlier this week. Uh, Genesis trading basically halted withdrawals. Uh, so Genesis is, I guess, the way that you can think of them is they started as an OTC uh, shop back in 2013 in crypto. Uh, Michael Moore was the CEO uh, back then, and this is a, one of the DCG uh, kind of sister companies, right? That's outright owned by DCG. They stand next to Grayscale, which is kind of their. They've got the GBTC closed end fund part of the, uh, type of structure. You know, it's part of the. You know, DCG Galaxy of Stars. The galaxy. Have you seen the movie That Thing You Do? It's like the bus full of bands and acts. Oh, you've never seen That Thing You Do? Oh, you have. You're taking a lot Michael. of inspiration from pop culture recently, Mark. Mike, I, I'm no, here seriously, for it. Michael, Michael, That Thing You Do, you have to watch it. Um, it's a great movie. Great All movie. Right, Shades. I'll, I'll put it on drummer. there. Um, watch it with the girlfriend, though. It's, it's yeah. a great date movie. We recently watched, uh, man, I can't believe I'm going to say this on this podcast, uh, Lindsay Lohan, uh, Falling for Christmas. Uh, it was aggressively average. <laughs> I, would, I would not necessarily recommend yes, it. Yes, I, uh, have, I, I have seen that. It's, ha- it's, it's almost Hallmark <laughs> season. You know, I got it in a is. lift. I got in a lift the other day. And the dude was playing like Christmas music at the top of the vibe. Like it is not even pre-thanks- Thanksgiving. Pre-Thanksgiving, yeah. It's pre-Thanksgiving. I think but but I, I do want to share one thing and, and then I'll come, let you go. But I had the coolest ride, lift ride last night. So mm. I spoke at the Catholic Crypto Conference, which was awesome. Actually, a lot mm. of people went there. It was actually pretty positive, um, you know, basically trying to help the church understand crypto. And uh, on my way back to the airport, this, this young woman picked me up and we got chatting. And on her, and the reason we got chatting, she was playing Preston Pish's The Investor's Podcast. Mm. Like, whoa, what are you doing? She says, well, you know, I, I, I grew up on, you know, really tough part of South Philly. And, uh, you know, I worked this, this nine to five job and I, I drive lift it in the evenings because I'm trying to save. I, I want to I wanna invest and I want to learn about things like crypto. And I'm like, wow. And, and I had this epic 45, because it was a lot of traffic, 45 minute conversation with Patience. My name is mm-hmm. Patience. Um, 
spelled in a very funky way, but her name was Patience. And I'm like, you know what? I almost wanted to hire her, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, I literally, it was, she had that much positive energy. You said cheerful, Mark used to go mm-hmm. three times. I'm sure she had, I mean, this is a woman from no means. Like she didn't go into all the, the detail, but um, I was really impressed. I mm-hmm. mean, I was really impressed. And like, that is the promise of what we're all fighting for. 100%. 100%. So anyway, just a, a funny little vignette. I'm, I'm with you on that. It's been a, uh, a lot of promise, but it has been a tough week. <laughs> so, oh, so Genesis. No, right? no, it's, yeah. it's tough. So Genesis, back to Genesis. Yeah, yeah Genesis, Genesis is tough. One, Genesis is tough. Hurts, hurts, bad. What, one, of the, one of the portfolio companies of, uh, you know, Digital Currency Group, they sit uh, next to Grayscale, probably is the closest tie, but then there's also Luno, there's Coindesk, and then there's Foundry, which is kind of the digital play. This is all at the outright owned companies by DCG. Uh, Genesis is basically the way you can think of them as prime brokerage, right? So they're a lender. Um, uh, most of the most of the borrow, right? Kind of a kind of a known, I guess, open secret in the crypto space. Much of the borrow, uh, the yield that you that you get on the retail platforms actually comes from Genesis in the form of partnerships. So generally, the way that it will work, right, is there will be some kind of like earn or yield program on. I'm making, but like, well, we can talk about Gemini a little bit because they have their earn program, which was impacted by this. So there was 8% that was offered in earn by Gemini. That actually came when you gave your coins to Gemini, they actually passed that to Genesis. They lend them out to funds. The funds earn yield. Genesis earns a spread. Uh, Gemini earns a spread. And that's how the yield kind of worked. So yep. there was a lot of uh, concern when Genesis halted withdrawals that this was going to impact other uh, programs. It's so not just Gemini. It's like Circle was impacted by this. You know, Luno off also gets yield from them. There was a whole bunch of whole bunch of different companies. Um, now, recently, uh, Ryan Selkis, ex uh, head of CoinDesk, DCG employee himself, uh, tweeted out the the, the pitch deck. Uh, so Barry Silbert is kind of hustling to raise a billion dollar bailout of Genesis's loan book. Um, so recapitalization. recapitalization, recapitalization, recapitalization. So I guess, Mark, what's your what's your take on? you know, Genesis closing its doors. What do you think ends up happening with that? Is there, you know, cause the, the, the word is there's more risk of contagion here. So what are your thoughts on all this? Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's funny you use that word. Cause uh, I'm, I'm gonna not, not slam you, but I'm gonna slam that word. Cause I had an <laughs> equally epic after my, my epic conversation with patients, mm. I got home and DTAP, Dan Tapiero, who we've had on the show, uh, I was talking to DTAP said, yesterday, who I was yeah. going to say, he also was poking fun at that word, but sorry, continue. Yeah. No, 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 no. no. So, so, so we had almost a two hour conversation into the wee hours, which is again, why I look the way I do, because mm-hmm. um, you didn't get enough sleep you again. And no, but Thursday nights, Michael, Thursday nights always seem to be bad. I mean, I, I, my flight was not delayed this time, but I got home and Dan wanted to talk. And when Dan wants to talk, he, he's a talker. I mean, I'm a talker, but he, that man... Back in. So two hours, we not quite two tap. hours. Not, oh no, I love Dan. I mean, and, and it, was, it, was a, it was an epic conversation. We talked about, we talked about a whole bunch of different things. And, you know, we are both in investors in, uh, in Gemini. We talked about a couple of things related to that. But one of the things he was saying is, look, Dan grew up in the macro space. He did all things macro, worked for Druck and, you know, just other legendary investors. And the word contagion has to do really with emerging market or developing market phenomenon where there's, there's a, a contagion that, uh, let's say there's a currency default in, in one country and it, and it you know, causes other defaults. This is different. This is, a, this is a deleveraging. This is an unwinding of interrelated transactions or interrelated relationships. It's, it's not really contagion. So again, just a DTAP little, uh, you know, clarification that contagion is different than, than deleveraging. But, but this is clearly a deleveraging. And, and I think, look, SBF, bad guy, bad things, just the whole the FTX thing is, is, is bad. And what I think none of us really realized, which is kind of scary because there are a lot of smart people in this business. I don't think people stopped and, and zoomed out and said, well, wait a second. If, if everyone is lending to one another and everything is interconnected, that, that clearly, so, so we can pick 
on individual companies for poor risk management. Or as, you know, the, the liquidator guy um, who, who cleaned up the Enron mess, who's now down in the Bahamas trying to clean up the mess. This is the most egregious example of that was pretty poor wild accounting. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, to say it's worse than Enron is not in terms of size, but just in terms of just no controls, lying, cheating, stealing, bad, bad malfeasance. That, that's saying something. But so we can point to individual examples and like we can point to, you know, did, did BlockFi have too much exposure to a single borrower? It could, you, could, you could make that, you know, you could say that's a risk management mm-hmm. failure. Could you say that, that Gemini should have had multiple prime brokers? You could say that. Um, so, but systemically, I don't think, at least there's no one I know. You know, it's so funny. The Monday morning, the Monday morning quarterbacking of this. Oh, I called this. You know, I'm I've with heard, you. I called this a couple months ago. I've even seen, you know, pretty good evidence of people who who actually did say something a few months ago. I had someone say this person called it a year ago. I'm like, no, no, they didn't. And you can't yeah. take a 20 second snippet of a 20 minute conversation and say, oh, that's where I said it. So I, I think it's actually worth saying you know, why it's actually so difficult to to be a voice there and to really give props to the people that pointed out, uh, you know, the flaws specifically with SBF, right? Yep. The reason why it's so difficult is there are, you know, when you're kind of going about your day and you have these business interactions, right? Like you form opinions about people. And sometimes you think, wow, this person doesn't necessarily seem above board, but they're in this extremely powerful position, right? And like, yeah. and like one, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I've got some internal prejudice and like, I'm not seeing the situation clearly. And maybe they're like a little quirky, but that doesn't necessarily mean they don't have the industry's best interest at art or they're not operating in an ethical way. So like, A, I could be wrong. But then B, what if I am right? What if I'm right that this person's not doing something that's necessarily ethical, yeah. but yep. they continue to stay in a position of power? For years and make your life difficult. So there's the could you're I describing be wrong? our entire governmental system. I mean. <laughs> I, yeah, but that's that's <laughs> why it's so difficult to, to speak up because you've got that little bit of self doubt. Nobody wants to be a hater. I don't want to be a, a hater, no, right? No. Um, but it yeah, that's why it's just so so tough um, to and you know well, it's it's the, it's the kid it's the kid right who always finally says the emperor has no clothes because mm-hmm. he's like what are you talking about the dude's naked yeah now. I'm sorry I put that image in your brain of FTX naked. I, I, I mean, uh, SBF naked. I'm, I'm sorry. But, but I didn't mean to do that. But, you know, the, I, this, this thing about when things are going well, we, mm. we don't question them, right? I've, I've you know, quoted my friend um, Bill Duhamel many, many times on the show, right? With every investment, we get richer or wiser, never both. Right? When things are going well. You, you're just not as critical. You're not as sharp uh, in terms of really digging in and say, well, why? Why is this so successful? Why, why is this happening? When things go wrong, everybody does analysis. And that's good. Mm-hmm. It's healthy. And that's why, that's why I'm so cheerful today. Because I think we are at that cathartic end of, yep, we fucked up. Mm. We fucked up bad. And... But, but, I, no, 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 I, I, and where, where I think you're going to go, I'm going to read your mind. Not I'm, all the I'm bodies. I'm going in a weird direction here. I'm okay, well, not all direction. bodies have floated to the surface. That's the problem. I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. And I, and I have some thoughts on, on who those bodies might be. I just want to get back to like, this is a, this is a for ex psych, psych major here, psych and classics. There's a great uh, study, pretty famous one, Solomon Ash on conformity. And there's, there's a couple like landmark psychology studies, and this one gets cited a lot. Uh, but basically, you know, participants are kind of all in a room, right? And they'll be shown lines of different lengths. And the, the lines of different li- the, the it'll be like, is this line the same length as this other line, right? And in one, in one instance of the trial, people write down their answers, right? And when they're writing down the answers in this, you know, semicircle of chairs or whatever, it's like 99, 100% accuracy, right? But uh, then in another instance of the trial, there's a confederate, which means there's someone who's in on the study. And what they do is they, you have to actually speak in this trial. So they'll look at two lines of different lengths and say, I think those look the same. <laughs> it is incredible. You can look at these lines that are clearly different lengths and people will say, yeah, I see the same thing as that guy. It looks like they're different lengths. It's like, it's this like mind blowing. Well, and, and there it there's goes a powerful to- psychological uh, 
you know, need within humanity, we, we can form. It's a, it's a psychological bias that humanity has. If the Confederate is presentable, likable, or forceful, and is like, I, I tell the story uh, on myself that, you know, my wife's only seen me speak once because she came to this conference and at the end she said, you can't say things like that. What I say? What I say? She says, no, no, no. It's not what you said. It's how you said it. You say things so forcefully. I'm like, well, what's wrong with that? She says, well, people will believe you. Mm. I'm like, well, that's the whole idea. So if that Confederate is like, oh, they're definitely the same way. Absolutely the same way. Everybody's like, uh, uh, well, uh, um, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course they are. Or I, 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 I didn't do the study, but I'll bet if it was somebody who was dodgy, sketchy, right? And said that other people would be like, no, I'm not agreeing with that person. I don't like that person. So it's yeah. like they said, the biases that we have or the, the prejudices we have probably impact that too. I have a question for you as a VC in this instance, because another kind of open secret, right, in VC is you piggyback on the due diligence of others. Huh. Right? Uh, so, right? <laughs> or so no one saying, does it. It's a big circle. A well, assumes B did it, B assumes C did it, C assumes D did it, D assumes A did it, and everybody says, I thought you did it. Correct. No one did it. Now, in this particular instance, right, with FTX, there were, you know, a number of very renowned investors, right? I'm not calling out anyone that isn't, you know, known, right? But it's like Tomasek, right? Sovereign Wealth Fund of uh, Singapore, uh, you know. Uh, Sequoia. Uh, Sequoia. So, well, Sequoia I mean, is the one that I was getting to. Sorry, that, that was the one I was getting to. Well, there's Tomasek, there's GIC. I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of, of glitterati investors that absolutely – 100% in venture capital, 100%. If somebody you admire or respect is in the deal, both your level of diligence falls, not for everybody and not every time, but your level of diligence falls because you assume that they did great diligence. Yep. And also there's this inclusion thing. Yeah. I, I, I want to be in that group. I'm a cool kid. I'm a cool kid. I, I want to be in that group. So what I want to get a sense of here is how, you know, in, looking in, right? First of all, I want to defend a little bit like that there's no excusing the state of finances that Alameda and FTX were in. Finances in a startup are tough, right? There's actually an example. Uh, Brian Armstrong went on a, a podcast episode this year, I think with Lex Friedman or something. He actually said at one point the finances were so tricky – they took the money from a raise and put it in a separate bank account because there's so like even very well intentioned, yeah. very good uh, operators. It, finances are tricky, but you know to look at the state that FTX was in, no board, no CFO. I mean, these are pretty basic <laughs> diligence things. Like so, from a VC's perspective, like how bad did Sequoia kind of mess up here on this? Like, is this like fireable offense type level for the partner that okayed it? Is it just like, ah, they messed up um, and this happens? What, you, what Can you give me some like- So, so it, it's, absolutely a, it's absolutely a fireable offense, but but which one are you going to point at? Because I think a lot of people were, were involved. But look, yeah, yeah. it's complicated. It's complicated. And, and this is something that, that I'm sure I'm wrong, that this isn't the only case of this. But I've been doing this a long time, Michael. I mean, I'm just old. And I don't remember- I mean, I really don't. And I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying hard to remember a case where an LP gave a fund multiple hundred million dollars. And then the fund turned around and wrote his company, his or her company, a check for hundreds of millions of dollars. I pointed that out too. I Okay. So I also thought that was super weird. Like, what? Uh, what, what has that ever happened before? And then I, I'm uh, sure it has. Jason voiced I, it uh, on another podcast to say, "Oh, it's not that weird in crypto. Actually, it happens sometimes." I was like, "I've never heard of that. How, mm -mm. how on a first principles basis does that make any sense? The nope. VC is giving money to the entrepreneur to turn into more money, right? They're supposed to allocate that capital. How does it make any sense for the, the them to turn around and reallocate it to the VC? What, what, what is that?" No, I look, it's, it's, I'm telling you, I've been doing this a long time. It is highly unusual. And as I, it's probably not the only one, but it is definitely highly unusual. And, and it's a total conflict. And I think it's going to come out that it's, that it really is part of the bad stuff that we were talking about last week that people were saying, oh, that's a conspiracy. I actually think it might be fact. Um, but here's the, the interesting thing about this. It wasn't just Sequoia, right? There were other people who were, you know, high up on the cap table that 
you know, either, either we're just fooled by the, I can't even say it. After what, as I said, I've never met SBF. And, and you know, Dan and I were talking about this last night. We both passed three times, not once, not twice, three times. Not because we did the diligence and knew it was wrong. Because so what, what made you pass? Valuation. I'm curious. Just valuation. Just mm. pure. It was like, there's no there there. The first time when it was $8 billion, I mean, they were just starting and there was this, there was like literally five or six people and it was like eight billion, really? No, yeah. no. Then at 16, some some really good people came in and that one, we paused. We actually had a discussion and said, oh, maybe we should look at this, but, but we were busy with uh, some other things. Um, the 32, that was like the open sea at 13 or 12 and a half or whatever it was. We're just like, NFW. No, no, that's just dumb. Now, because of that, never met the man, boy, kid, whatever. Never met Caroline. And I, and I, will, I, will, I will stand on this. Had I ever met that young woman, would have run away. There's, there's no way, no way anyone will convince me that she played well in a meeting with serious financiers. I don't yeah. even believe he did. I really don't. You know, this whole thing about, oh, he's playing video games because he's so smart. Now they're saying, well, but he never got above bronze three. Like my yeah. seven-year-old is higher than that. So I don't I, know if that's I, real or if that's made up or, but. See, now like the, the, I, I take that all with a big grain of salt because it's like, yeah, of course now we're piling on and yeah, okay. Are there all these yeah. signs? Like the, I think the, I think the important thing to note, right? The valuation, there were warning signs there in the beginning. I don't know if you saw this deck that was getting passed around raising a 15% rate of return, no risk. I mean, those are like small, but important, Un important no, no, no. things. That, that's another one. That is a absolute red flag, mm -hmm. right? When you use terms like guaranteed, no risk, you know, will make guaranteed. you whole. Look, here's the thing. As much as I, and I'm, I'm struggling here because I, I think I really do admire CZ. Dan and I were talking about this last night. Like, I think he really is smart. Like, where I don't think, SBF is really smart. Now I went to MIT somehow. I okay, so he's smarter than me, but I don't think he's smart. I really don't. And that's disingenuous since I've never met him, but all the evidence says mm. not really smart. But well, I think CZ is really smart. And I think CZ for sure. CZ and oh, I'm gonna wrap this back to Genesis. So so yep. Genesis happens and and it's caused this hole for Gemini, meaning they can't get the assets that they're due, which means they have to suspend withdrawals on, on their earned product. There's a moment here. There's an opportunity for the Winklevoss twins. And if you're listening, which they probably aren't, but if you're listening, guys, this is your, and, and, and I don't want to say CZ moment because some people don't like CZ. They think he's a CCP operative and all this stuff. But the man... They had a $40 million hack three years ago, whatever it was. Mm. And he dug into his pocket and set up the SAFU fund, said, I'm guaranteeing this. And, and when, when Dan asked him why, he said, the most important thing is trust. If my clients don't trust me and the firm, we cannot survive. And here's the thing. And, 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 so this is, this is the twins moment. They could come up and say, we have the balance sheet to support this business and we're going to do that. And yes, we'll raise outside capital and, and, you know, but, but we are going to make you. And if they became the trusted exchange, the growth would, would be like, you know, CZs. And I will say, Brian Armstrong tried this. The Wall Street Journal ad yesterday is an example of this. Mm -hmm. And I applaud. I saw I it. I applaud, Brian. I saw it. I I'm, it. I've been loving Coinbase recently. I'm going to go out and say I, really, I think he's, I've been loving him. He's killing it. Yeah. He's killing it. And okay, as an owner, a, I'm, I'm a happy man. I've got a question for you. Yeah. If you're Barry Silbert, do you backstop that whole business? Because talk about in for a penny, in for a pound. Okay. The annuity, right, on Grace, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, 
who wouldn't want right that's like a hundred million dollars a year in basically an annuity right they're just printing cash my question you have to you have to but the question is and again i don't know he's already he's already spent i think he he spent somewhere around 700 million dollars on buybacks of gbtc so far this year he plugged the genesis hole multiple times i mean yeah so i don't know big checks if this raise means the cover's a little bit bare, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know his personal balance sheet. I, I again, I, I would say the same thing for Barry that I would say about about the Winklevoss twins. This is your moment, right? You you want to be the trusted advisor. This, look, this is what J.P. Morgan did in 1907. Now, <laughs> it was a little different. He fomented the panic at Knickerbocker mm-hmm. Trust. Then he's like, oh, but I will guarantee the banking system. Well, me and my friend, John D. Rockefeller, because you know, I don't have all the money. Johnny the world, D. Johnny D. Titan, yeah. what, he's called Titan for a reason. I mean, yeah. the best businessman in the history of business. Full yeah. stop. Not the yeah, nicest sure. man, but the, the best Here's the thing. He gave a lot of it away. He actually donated anonymously to many. You know how Vanderbilt's on the name of everything? Vanderbilt this, Vanderbilt that. There's a university and everything. Apparently, John D. Rockefeller donated far more. uh, I guess there's 30 Rock. But like his name isn't on a bunch of the stuff. Oh, no, no no question. It might, though, be – it might (laughs) be atoning for some of the sins. Like 200-some-odd people vanished. Mm. Like they would strike against his company and – they just disappear. What's going on, guys? Want to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Curve. They are the one-stop shop credit cards that helps you take control of your personal finances. Here's the reason that I personally love this company. These guys are all about helping you manage and maximize your personal cash flow. We have been talking for the last couple of months about everything that the Fed is doing with raising interest rates. Obviously, this is not, no one's got a crystal ball. This is not financial advice, but I think it makes sense more than ever now for companies to be managing their cash flow and for you as an individual to be managing your personal cash flow as well. Curve makes it super, super easy to do that. Even I can do it as a technological Philistine. They aggregate all of your spending information in one place. They make it super easy to plan, but they actually go one step further than that. They have a very cool feature called go back in time, which allows you to switch payments from one card to another. So if you have an unexpected expense crop up, boom, you can move that over to your credit card, free up some cash. Or maybe you learned too late that you could have earned more rewards by spending on a different card. Boom, Curve has you covered there too. And the last thing that I'll say is, if you click the link at the bottom of this episode, you'll get $20 in Curve cash, but you'll only get that if you click the vanity link at the bottom of this episode. Plus, that gives me the credit as well. So thank you, Curve. I appreciate you caring about cash flow. Guys, click the link at the bottom of this episode. Tell them I sent you. So here's here's a I, I want to get to the the, the Genesis uh, you know any any, any um, anything that might come from Genesis basically so for me what I'm here like the the fallout from this from FTX that we might not have total access to and Genesis you know what what immediately comes to mind for me is uh, some of the market neutral or more trading type strategies right like yep. they they were unfortunately victims of FTX because if you want to be trading these markets then you know, you you have to basically be on multiple exchanges, like our good friend, uh, you know, Travis Kling, who put that tweet thread out uh, earlier yep. this week. Like, love Travis, uh, you'll come back, buddy, one hundred percent. I know you will. Uh, but that that's who, uh, and you know, I don't know. So so when you say the bodies are still out there, like, you know, any speculation on on what the the fallout or or who that might be? You know, I I I don't I don't think, um, you know, I. And I have to be I have to be cautious here because you know we're an, we're you know meaningful investors in Gemini, mm-hmm. and uh, I want only the best for that company. And I and I believe I believe they they could navigate through this. But I, you know, FTX, Alameda, screw Genesis. Therefore, you know, by mm-hmm. association is 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 potentially hurting hurting the Gemini business. So I, I think that one. It's cautious. Uh, the one I, I, and Dan and I talked a lot about this, a lot about this last night. Um, I'm still concerned about Tether, not, not the way other people are, but just simply that, at least the numbers I've seen, 36 billion of the 65 
is somehow related to FTX and Alameda. Okay. So um, that seems like it could be bad. Now, it's possible that that got out of the bad entities and, and actually is in Tether and actually exists, but they don't ever show us, right? And the fact that they're in the Bahamas where this guy was and the fact that they met the other day, that makes me nervous. But, but Dan pointed out a really good point. The industry, our industry, our collective industry in the last 12 months, this is, this is a painful thing to say out loud, has vaporized $2 trillion. Yeah. Okay. Now that, that, that's only twice as much as Amazon alone vaporized. Okay. One stock. And you know, when, when Pomp and, and Wapner, the judge were, were debating the other night on, on CNBC and, you know, he's like, you know, isn't this irresponsible to put people in, in crypto? I'm like, Scott. And I actually tweeted him all this. I was like, Scott, you do realize people, right? The people that you're, you're talking about protecting lost way more in Amazon than they did in crypto or Bitcoin. Mm. Like maybe two or three times as much. Mm. But so, but two trillion bucks in a year, think about that. That's like 170 mil, $170 billion with a B a month. So if 36 B vaporized, you know, that's 10% of, you know, Bitcoin, but it's a fraction of what we've been burning every month. So it's like, it's not that big a deal. And it's probably, even if, even if it doesn't match a hundred percent, it's not zero, right? There's, there's not zero assets at Tether. Mm. Absolutely no chance there's zero assets. So is it 80 cents on the dollar, 90 cents on the dollar? I don't really know. Now, it needs to be 100 cents on the dollar to actually be what it says it is. Um, so I, so I, that, that was one that I, I, I still have. And then I, I wonder if some of the big trading firms are still not talking publicly about losses. Yeah. And I'd have to, I would have to imagine that as well. So, I have, so I have no knowledge, you know, no, no, I, 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 I don't, I mean, yeah, I have friends um, at, at all of them and, and I, but, and, and they're a little different, right? They're trading and trading. You're not holding stuff on balance sheet, like a lender. And so, um, can you explain look, how that works? Well, look, if, if, if I'm a lender, okay, I, I, I take assets and I, and I hold them on my balance sheet and then I lend them to other people but I still have a liability to the person who deposited those assets. If I'm a trading firm, they're my assets. Mm -hmm. Now I may trade on other people's behalf, but, but I'm, I'll tell you a story. So jump. And again, I'm not saying jump has any troubles, but I have a friend who used to be one of the partners at jump and we're talking one day and this is so funny. We're having dinner in Chicago and, and he brought these, these two coders with him that, that wrote all his models. It was like, two of the smartest people I've ever met. I mean, one was from Eastern Europe and one actually was from China. And these, these people were just out of their mind, brilliant. And we're talking about all this stuff. And I said, all right, so at the end of the day, what, what are you trying to do? He says, well, we never go home with a position, right? We're flat at the end of every day. So that's the big difference. It's not like your money is subject to this kind of gap risk because you're in and you're out. Every day we're flat. And we're trying to make 1%. I'm like, I'm like what? 1% a month? He says, no, no, every day. I'm like, shut, shut, shut the fuck up. <laughs> he says, yeah, that's why we don't talk about it. And that's why we don't tell everybody. But yeah, 1% a day. I'm like, oh my God. So that compounding is nuts. Yes, let's compound 1% a day, um, 250 days a year. Yeah, it's a big number. So um, those guys I don't think have, now, could they have <clears throat> places where they, didn't get whole every day, right? Where they, they lost a little bit of money and they tried to trade their way out of it and burn some of their it's possible for sure. So, so I'm not sure that, that those guys have it. I, and anyone, any like big institution that puts some money in, it was such a small percentage 
of their their assets. I don't I don't, I don't think that's going to sink yeah. anybody. So I think, I think you know, there, there's one other lender that mm-hmm. I'm worried about, um, mm-hmm. and I won't cast aspersions on anybody because I, I like them and I I'm mm-hmm. rooting for them. But I I know there's one other lender that has been victimized by this, and and I use that term very intentionally. Mm-hmm. I'm sick and tired of people trying to cast the people that were running these lending business as bad people. That is just BS, right? In the savings and loan crisis, the vast majority of savings and loans were good, honest people. Charles Keating, fine. He was a jerk and, and stole. And in the whole Milken debacle, there were a lot of really good people doing junk bonds. Boski, not so much. And here again, just because you um, built a lending business doesn't make you a bad person. Everybody's like, yes, fractioners are banking. It's a fraud. No, it's not. Fractioners are banking is what creates greatness. It's what creates growth. I'll say it and I'll keep saying it. Name a country without or with a lousy fractioners or banking system that you would live in. You just, no, no. You want to go live in Democratic Republic Congo? Be my guest, right? You want to go live in Somalia? Be my guest. And I'm not picking on those people in a, in a you know, just because they're both in Africa, but they don't have good fractures or bank. I go through Latin American countries that don't have good fractures or banking systems. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, fractures or banking is not the problem. You know, hate the player, not the game. Yeah. The player, Sam Bankman Freed, bad person. Now, again, I think it's not him. I think he's the useful idiot. I think it's other people, but that'll, you know, those will, those will, we'll find out later. I've got a question for you. Uh, before we move on to the macro, do you, um, you know, obviously it, it never sounds, I, I, I don't know this, right. But the, I, I started to see people call for this that I, that I trust and respect a lot. Um, you know, it's hard to imagine mar- markets are forward looking, right? So the expectation mm-hmm. of what's going to happen often matters more than what's actually happening. Now, the caveat there is, right, if all these firms are going bankrupt, right, that, you know, that obviously markets care about what's happening in the here and now as well. Uh, there's a supply yeah. and demand yeah. aspect to it. But really, as it's long a delicate as markets balance kind between of those two. see through, right, point. and it's expectations. So, you know, one thing that's been, you know, it seems significant to me this week is as all this bad news is coming out, Genesis goes under, price has been relatively flat. I mean, it hasn't really moved all that much. So, you know, when I see that, there's more bad news. Oh my God, that, you know, part of me is starting to say is the sentiment, the sentiment and the price action aren't necessarily matching yeah. up. So yep. I, I'm, I'm curious if you start to see that as, you know, the forming of a bottom. Um, I'm just kind of asking, like, how can I get much? No, much look, it's funny. So um, Brian Estes runs on Chain Capital. Yeah, uh, great guy. His wife was at the, the Catholic Crypto Conference, who I love. I mean, look, we all overmarry, but some take it to an art form. And, <laughs> and you know, Brian, but look. You know, I always describe my wife as you know the, my better ninety percent because mm-hmm. you know she is she is everything in this relationship. But um, you know, Kelly's great, and so she said, you know, I was ready for crypto winter, but no one told me that the ice age was coming. <laughs> and I no, no, I mean I, I get it, and and it feels like that. But no, this is nor'easter Sam or Hurricane mm-hmm. Sam. That's what this is. And I've described this, you know, live in North Carolina. It's freezing today. You know, by March, it'll be warm. And on occasional days, I'll be able to grill outside. It'll be 70 degrees. But once every decade or so, a big old nor'easter swirls off the coast and dumps 10, 12, 15 inches of snow. (laughs) We don't know how to deal with that. But after four or five days, it goes away. Mm. And I believe that's what's happening here. I believe it is crypto spring. I don't believe it's winter. I don't believe it's the ice age. I believe it's crypto spring. Spring is, I said, it's messy. It's muddy. It's, and, and this is a nor'easter perpetuated by bad people. Now, what would change that? Well, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, this, there's these conspiracy theories about how the government seeds the clouds to change the weather and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. If that's going on, right? If, if this was all a plan to destroy crypto so that the banks could stay in charge. 
and that there's punishing regulation, like, like handcuff kind of regulation coming, that would, that would, that would, that would create a, a series of storms that maybe it is the ice age. I, um, I was in the, I was in Washington DC this week, uh, for the blockchain association policy summit. Um, first of all, Shout out to the Blockchain Association and Coin Center, putting the whole industry on their backs, advocating for us. They do not get nearly enough. Uh, uh, amen. Second and enough props emotion. for the Second work that, that they emotion. do. Uh, very well run event. A lot of uh, you know big policymakers, senators, congressmen, regulators, etc. The mood, if I had to summarize, it was actually not all that negative. Um, and basically, the positive, the most positive silver linings interpretation of everything that's gone on is that a SBF was arguing for very unfriendly crypto policy and most people <laughs> knew that right yeah. and and he's yeah. not out right so yeah. at least we don't have someone that's arguing against us right that's supposed to be one of the fold and then uh the other you know the other observation was he was the bill that he was pushing dccpa he is so heavily associated with and now he's toxic in washington it's less likely that that's going to go through so right. they're, they're they're positive you know the the mood and and the, and the midterms worked out in such a way. Again, I'm not a political expert. I don't really understand how all this works, but apparently the midterms worked out in such a way that's not horrendous for crypto. So that I, I will just say that's that's yeah. not ultimately super yep. positive. I, I want to make sure we get to some macro content here. It it almost feels a little funny because we're we're still in this like holding pattern in in some ways that we've been describing for a long period of time, and the stuff that we continue to harp on on this show has hasn't really ultimately changed that much. I sort of feel like we're still in this weird limbo state. But just to check mm -hmm. in on how things are going on, you know, the yield curve is more inverted than any period of time that's been in the last like 40 years, yep. right? Yep. So this is the spread between the 10-year and the two-year, and it just continues to dip lower, right? So wh wh what's actually changing? I mean, the stock market is basically flat, right? Uh, so it hasn't really started to change all that much. And, you know, what's funny is it's almost like there's this weird concentric hallucination where I, I'm not sure people... I. I I'm just going to say, I don't really quite understand what's going on um, because the economy, people are still spending. I mean, retail sales yeah. are still up. It's it's strong yeah. retail sales. But, but, well, but that's, again, that's a lie because mm. they don't adjust for inflation. Mm. These are nominal numbers. Wait, and it's, hold on. This is, this is real and nominal here. And even okay. real, in real retail sales, it's still up. Debt, credit cards. So, mm. so th there's no question that, that people are definitely spending. So, you know, I was just on a bunch of airplanes and people at this conference and the airports are full. So it, it is true that people are definitely spending. Um, I said, this is a 2001 like recession, mm. right? Very light. And if you go back to 2001, it wasn't even that horrible a year in markets. The markets were down like 13, 14%. Tech it was. Pardon? If you worked in tech, it was probably pretty horrible. No, well, it's interesting. OO was down eight nine. Nasdaq was a little worse. O one started down, but then actually recovered. Believe it or not, after nine eleven, people thought the Fed was going to ride to the rescue. So there was this mm. little temporary respite, and it was twenty twenty two. That was I mean, 2002. That was the horrible year, right? Down 24, mm. percent and that was when we we did the cathartic all the way down 84. percent But yes, companies were closing. Pets.com was going out of business. Webman was going out of business, and I think the same thing's happening in crypto, right? The bad projects are going to go away and literally go to zero. But like the dot coms, many of the ideas are good. They're just not ready for prime time yet because we need other things like bridges and and, and other things. Uh, technologically. But on the point on, on retail sales, so in 2001, first quarter was negative, second quarter was positive, third quarter was negative, fourth quarter was positive. 1% for the whole year. Still a recession, but short. The difference between then and now is we had the Enron blow up, we had the WorldCom blow up, and that caused a credit crunch and a crisis that, that led to the, the 2002 downturn that was big. And I think we're, we're at the same place in that this year, the economic activity hasn't been awful, right? First quarter is negative, second quarter is negative, but third quarter was positive. Now, most of that positive was really just net exports of oil, but it was flat. It wasn't like down three or 4%. And fourth quarter, they're saying, oh, it's going to be up 4%. Again, little funky business with the SPR, but, but fine. 
you know, there's there's the you know they're they're saying it's going to be a great quarter. Now the consensus is saying not so much, but but the Fed, Atlanta Fed says big number, and I think it's it's like a 2001. Now the difference to me is in 2001 2002, the Fed did get the memo, and then it started expanding liquidity to try to fix the problem. This time they're not right. They're doing the opposite, mm-hmm. and so. The layoffs just started. They're all announced after the election. I love that. Literally the day after the election. 11,000 mm. layoffs, 20,000 layoffs. I mean, really? I mean, mm. the day after? Um, so that's going to ripple through. And those are not low-wage jobs, right? No. And, and the, you know, 70, 75% of people working at Twitter. I'm guessing that people working at Twitter were not making minimum wage, would be my guess. That's a whole bunch of people. And so mm. I, now you've got it right there, initial jobless claims, right? Yeah. I've got, you know, I, I, I'm of kind of two minds about this. I, I have sort of a, a bit of a theory in terms, I think it's impactful, but let me run this by you. So, you know, I was talking to one of my friends the other day and he was saying, you know, if you basically took every tech job, right? Like Twitter, Amazon, you know, Facebook, Google, all these jobs combined and laid everyone off, whole sector just kaput. It would adjust the unemployment index would adjust by like 30 basis points or something like that. Even though these are highly paid jobs, it's a relatively Mm -hmm. small number of the total jobs in the economy. Here's where I think it matters quite a bit. Tech for a long time, if you worked at like Google and Amazon, what do we we know about Google? They give you free lunch and they give you all this stuff. They've got a beautiful campus. And like the other thing, they don't really work you that hard. You know, they, Mm -hmm. they, 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 it's like, I've got friends who work in tech. It's like, you know, 10 to 10 to four and 10 to five. And you got these like happy hours and nice things and all these perks. I have, I have a friend who works. I, I told this anecdote earlier this week, but I've got a friend who works at a large public tech company. Um, mm. But she's like, it has changed basically. Yes. They yes. said, they said, they sent out a, you know, before that it was like, Oh, work from wherever you want. Don't worry. You have to be in the office tomorrow. If you're within 40 miles of a office and office, get in there. You know, back in the office indefinitely. If you're in sales, boom, they put you into pods, 100 people in a pod, get up in front of those people. You have to pitch in front of everyone and and they critique you live yeah. in front of everyone. Yeah. They yeah. separate you into the good track, right? So they're still smart, right? If you're, if you're performing here, we want to show you track to success. Then they also shunt people into the bad track and it's like, hey, we're basically yeah. going to grind you out. It is, it is changing. And I think this has a, a, an impact on people because- you know, in the back of your mind, everyone's got a friend who works in tech. And even if you wouldn't necessarily work in tech or if you couldn't get mm-hmm. a job at like an Amazon, mm-hmm. you think to yourself, I could be making a lot of money doing not very much work. That 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 idea sits in the back of Love. everyone's head. Yeah. And yeah. and now you have taken that away. Now That's how I feel people- about Tom Cruise. I, 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 I could do that. I could sit in the back of a fighter plane and, and look like I'm flying it and make twenty million dollars. I could do that. No, yeah. I didn't. No, I didn't. Mm-hmm. That, so that's, I think, what's ultimately impactful here. And the, the thing that's that's curious and why it actually might not be horrendous for tech value, I am watching Twitter with a lot of interest, frankly. I'm watching it with it. It's, an, it's been a, it's a very, it's a good product that gets a lot of use. They haven't been able to monetize it. The, this is not my area of expertise. I'm sort of relying on what I've heard other people say. It's been overstaffed for a long period of time. Elon Musk comes in, he chops 50% of the, the staff right away. This could go one of two ways. He this could blow up in his face. Uh, Twitter could be understaffed. You know that the app could suffer, and it's like, oh, hey, you you thought you could come in here and just chop this and, and make big change and not. Yeah. The other thing that could happen is Twitter basically works just as well as it was doing before, and they start printing free cash flow, yeah. and that would be a very powerful signal and message, I think, to the rest of the tech industry. So look, I, I, I it's, it's it's a great analysis and. And absolutely could happen, and you know it's, it's similar in in some ways to the to the Amazon story, right? Amazon, mm-hmm. you know, was was always you know losing money, losing money, losing money, and they're like, well, we can turn it on ever anytime we want, right? We can just stop spending the way we have been spending to build infrastructure. Now this is a little different that you're going to cut wasted spending as opposed to uh, infrastructure growth once you have enough. But but I I totally agree with you that that this could change things. And and so the question on, you know, 
where are we economically? I think we're teetering on the precipice of a garden variety recession turns into a depression, right? The 90 year cycle, bad policy decisions. You know, we've already uh, restricted fiscal, right? And we've restricted monetary, you know, money supply growth shrunk for the first time in 40 years. So, so all of that says economic growth is going to slow next year. Okay, fine. Now, if we do some other dumb things from a policy perspective, that could snowball. China still got zero COVID. You know, we still got to get through, you know, global trade collapsing. Um, all of that says lower growth, lower profits. And if you look at earnings, earnings finally rolled over, Michael. Yeah. I mean, they had been stubbornly high, even though economic growth was crashing. Earnings, I, and now yeah. earnings have really started. And in the third quarter, they didn't punish companies who missed. Yep. Like, what, what, what do you mean? I, did, this company just like barfed and, and the stock's not going down. And in fourth quarter, there was a little bit of punishment, but, but not a lot. So I do think... I don't know. I, I'm, I'm of the mind to your point earlier that, that is, is really the most important point that markets anticipate, right? So the markets were down more than the economy was kind of through third quarter. Mm. And now, you know, markets recovered a little bit. Now this, this does happen. The first two weeks of, of November are always great for junky stuff. And, and what happened is a number of years ago, they changed the law on what the year end was for mutual funds. So it used to be 1231. And there was this thing called the January effect, where the mutual funds would all sell in December. They had to wait 30 days to avoid wash sale rules and buy back the stuff. So every January, there'd be this big uptick in a bunch of stocks, mostly small caps, and everybody would trade that. Well, then they changed the rules and it went to October 31st. So now they sell in October and it's been getting earlier and earlier because uh, everybody's trying to, you know, front run the other one. And then they wait 30 days. And so January, February, if you look, it's the crappiest, like Carvana, right? Carvana equity is worthless. Zero. It, it's a zero. Yeah. But it went up 30% last Friday in a day because of a massive short squeeze. Why? Well, because all the mutual funds puked Carvana and Peloton and Zoom and all these things. And what they do? They filled up their window dressing for their annual report. Oh, Exxon Mobil, Chevron, we own these oil companies and we own these, these uh, you know, they got rid of their fangs and they bought, you know, the banks. And it's like, what are you doing? Well, it's just window dressing. That's just make believe. Now, in the you know, first two weeks of November, they buy all that garbage back. And because mm. everybody's short, you get a short squeeze. And then you had the, oh, he's only going to raise 50 basis points instead of 75, and we get an up 6% day in NASDAQ. By the way, and I've said this before, there are no up 4% days. In bull markets. In bull markets. There just aren't. And so I think we're still in a bear market. I think... I think we're trying to bottom, but, and you had the Bullard yesterday say, we're going to 7%. So, you know, cause inflation is still a problem. I think I, my, my personal opinion, inflation is coming down. Deflation is a bigger risk than inflation. Earnings are going to be stinky for a while. Growth is going to be eh. first quarter growth. Definitely negative. Definitely negative. How bad it is. I don't know. Um, that's a long answer. Mm. No, I, I think you're, I, I think you're hitting on, uh, you know, two things that I want to dive into here, which is, well, well, one, I, the, the one thing that I want to get your, your thoughts on here. Again, we've, we've talked about. Sorry, I was going and looking, by the way, you know, talking about earnings. I, w I wanted to see the, the first time that we talked about earnings missing on this podcast. It was mid June. Uh, I've, I've also just been waiting for this. It's like you, you hear all this stuff, and you go, "How are these companies still forecasting earnings that are going to increase?" Yeah, yeah, June of this year. Uh, so I just. Again, in some ways, I feel like a broken record uh, talking about a lot of these things. But same things with, with housing, right? So the home builder, you know, optimism index is, you know, it, it's trending 
down to levels, uh, you know, back from the great financial crisis, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's also interesting to kind of look at, you know, these, these charts, which by the way, these come from the daily shot. Daily shot is great. Uh, but you know, you'll daily shot at, is great at sober. Look is, is amazing. Yeah. It's, it's really awesome. Um, uh, you know, building per, uh, building permits versus, uh, the purchase index, right. Which indicates, you know, that gap there, you know, indicates much more downside to come where the head Same. goes, the body follows, you know, right. An old wrestling guy that the housing is done. Mm. I mean, it's done, done. Um, there's just, this, there's just no way that people can go from a 3% mortgage to a 7% mortgage. None. Zero. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's not possible. Yeah. Maybe this is a, maybe this is a better chart to illustrate just how drastic the, you know, the impact here is. And maybe this also, you know, the, the, the reason why there might be such a lag, right, is because we moved off of, in the United States at least, ARMs, right, adjustable rate mortgages during mm -hmm. the great financial crisis. Now the government has basically subsidized fixed rates, right? So people that have their homes, basically they're like, oh, I locked in this great mortgage. I'm just going to stay here. I don't want to, I'm going to stay. You know, I don't wanna, I'm going to stay, right? I'm not going to sell it. Uh, but you, you can actually look at the purchase index, the MBA purchase index. It's at the lowest point in about a decade. The year over year change in the purchase index, record low. Lowest record. on record going yeah. back to going back to the nineties at least. So people are not mm -hmm. buying new homes at these new rates. People aren't necessarily they don't want to sell because they've locked into these great rates. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's so it's all it's in in my opinion, it looks like it's almost artificially elevating the the price well, of the housing. And you've pointed where, this out many, many times on the show that you know, what drives economic activity? It's housing, right? Because then yeah. you got to go buy furniture. You got to go hire service people to come fix things that aren't aren't working. You got to you know put some art on the walls, and you got to paint. And you know, you know, a gallon of Sherwin Williams paint. Someone told me it's like a hundred dollars now. A hundred dollars. I mean, obviously, I haven't bought paint in a long time. That that shocked me. I was going to say, is that the paint people use? I don't, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that. Well, and if you look at Sherwin-Williams stock, it, it's like a license to print money, right? Because mm -hmm. I guess the, the ingredients of paint are, are relatively cheap, but the glamour of the brand, not that you got a glamorous paint, but, you know, painters like a certain brand or people like a certain brand. And I mean, now I, you know, actually, I, I should look at that. I don't know if it's been great lately, but for years, it was just like this, 45 degree line up because anytime they wanted to, they would just, you know, uh, increase prices. And, um, so eh, it's, it's down 32% this year. But if you look at, if you look at the max chart from, from 90, no, from 88 at 28 cents, you know, it's at $237 today. So, mm. I mean, it kind of looks like, kind of looks like an Amazon chart. Um, mm. but hundred bucks for a gallon of paint blew me away. Yeah. So look, we're in limbo right now. I think there's still a big overhang in terms of housing. It does look like while retail sales, even real retail sales are relatively up. I should have probably put a chart here on consumer credit because basically people are just maxing out their credit cards to do it. I don't a hundred percent think that economic reality has set in. So, you know, yeah. ho ho hopefully it's a garden variety recession. Um, yeah, I'm, I've got my fingers crossed for nothing worse than that. Uh, Mark, I think we've got to wrap it here. This has been a fun one, as always, my friend. Favorite hour of my as week. Always. I will yeah. see you here. Uh, 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 oh, no, always, always the best hour of my week. And and look, I I just I always appreciate the work you do to prep yeah. and to put together the the best stories. And I, you know, I say this all the time: questions are way more important than answers. Right? My job is to spit out answers and talk, but but the important part of everything we do is the questions. And it's, I, I saw this the, the other day, that, that intelligence is knowing, or knowledge is having answers. Intelligence is being able to formulate questions, but wisdom is knowing when, when to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. And you are a wise man. So. We got yin and yang, my man. We got yin and yang. I think it works. Yeah. Um, All right, Jeff. All right, Mark. I will see you here uh, next week. Cheers. Bye.